Mr. President, your time is up. Today, the African leader who won't leave office and who, in so doing, risks throwing his country into another destabilizing war. Why did opposition parties in DR Congo sign up to a dodgy deal to keep Joseph Kabila in power? I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. The Democratic Republic of Congo should be the success story of Africa. It has huge natural resources, a commanding central position astride the equator, and access to the Atlantic Ocean. But for the last 20 years, it has been mired in conflict, and now it has an unpopular president who's refusing to leave his job. Joseph Kabila's mandate was supposed to finish last December, after two terms, and a new prime minister was due to be elected to oversee new general elections to be held later this year. Neither has happened. Insights Juliana Oleinka explains more. In Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, these Catholic bishops have played a key role in attempts to unify a country that has historically been anything but united. <laughs> Joseph Kabila is out. Following weeks of tense negotiations, a power-sharing deal has been signed to end his 15-year rule. One pivotal name is missing from the agreement. The president himself is yet to add his signature. Our people need elections. Our people need a change. Now we have this accord that will enable us to get there to achieve that. Kabila's mandate ran out in December and his refusal to step down from power has ignited the tensions. Violent clashes with security forces across the country. 40 dead. The somewhat reclusive leader has been in power since the 2001 assassination of his father Laurent. He didn't want to step down either and was killed by his own bodyguard at the height of the Second Congo War. Kabila was confirmed as leader in 2006 and again in 2011, when international observers say he won in a fraudulent election. For the past 15 years, Kabila has not made any progress in terms of leading Congo forward. So we have the same crisis that we had before, so impunity continue to be the biggest threat Congo faces. The institutions of the state are not functioning as they should be functioning. We cannot continue on this path. It has to leave. So how did the country get here? Voters in the DRC were to have elected a new president in 2016. Elections were cancelled as authorities announced plans to revise the electoral process. The announcement was met with global condemnation. The opposition believe in Kabila was seeking a third term. So what's in the deal to solve this crisis? Under the new terms, Kabila will be out by the end of the year. A transition council headed by the opposition will be in charge of securing this. A prime minister will be appointed imminently, also from the opposition. Elections will then be called before the end of 2017. Is there a credible opposition? A transition at the top of Cong Congolese governance, uh, the change of president in peaceful democratic terms would be an extraordinary step forward. Would it be a wholesale shift in either the personnel or the patterns of the way Congo's run? Well, probably not. Many are still sceptical that Kabila will honour the deal. The theories over the courses of this year that people within his political party, people within his political family could attempt to sabotage this peace deal or power sharing deal by doing silly and nasty things. We expect, as we've seen before, that there could be new militia gangs created um, in terms of distracting the international attention from actually focusing on the power sharing deal. Kabila is accused of looting millions from the mineral rich state and the Congo has one of the most violent pasts on the continent. Like many before him, the leader is well aware that his presidential palace is the most secure way of avoiding jail and even death. 
that we have in the DRC at the moment a very counterintuitive situation where Kabila is very weak compared to other African strongmen. He hasn't been able to force his will on the politics, on the population. He hasn't been able to change the constitution or demand further terms. The exam question to me, the very interesting thing is why has such a weak president been able to stagger on in a position of authority for such a long time? If Kabila is really removed in a peaceful transition, observers say it could usher in groundbreaking changes across Africa and for other dictators clinging to power on the continent. Juliana Olayinka, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined in the studio by Temi Tope Alodo, who is an African security strategist and an author. Also with us is Tonsanka Jo, who is an Africa analyst. Um, Temi Tope, why is he still there? From, from what we're seeing, there seems to be a lot of interplay. Um, there's a lot of countries involved in this whole saga. About nine bordering countries, countries bordering. Bordering. There's influence from outside the country. There's the material issues in terms of mineral resources and the things, gold, diamonds, everything. So the conflict here is not just on the surface of it political. It involves the wealth transfer and other things. The opposition, the party, his main party, has a reason for maintaining him in power, and that's the reason why he stayed here. Because why do you think he's still there? Uh, there are quite a number of reasons. Um, the first, I think, is because the uh, DR Congo could not have elections when they are due. And this is a practical issue, not just a political issue. Um, and uh, there are a number of people who have said that the opposition, political opposition in particular, we have an interest in seeing him out of power, especially given that this is his final term in office. Yeah. He is no longer eligible to stand again. Yeah, just to explain why, because he was due to, we all knew this, he was going to yeah. finish last month in December 2016 right so he's so refused to go why, why no, is he still it, there he didn't refuse to go this is the this is the issue that that we have what happened was elections should have been held November yeah. 2016 yeah. Yeah. and he's, he would have been handing over to a new president in December yeah. but then what happened is the electoral commission in the country in the DR Congo said they were not ready to have credible elections. Right, let's put that into perspective. This is a country that is bigger than West, uh, that is bigger than Europe, yes. west of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. They are a huge land mass, isn't it? Right across yeah, Central Yeah, the Africa. approximation yeah. is the population is about 80 million. Yeah. You might assume that about 50 million people are eligible to vote, yeah. but there is no voters role. There is no system in place to make sure that everyone who has a right to vote will have yeah. the opportunity to vote. So the other people were saying that uh, there is no way the election outcome but, of such a scenario would be credible. All right, which is why I, they, I, take, I take your face value on that, but why not? Because they knew this was coming. They've yeah, had plenty of time to this, prepare. Exactly. So why and, have they messed it up? And the same electoral commission was responsible for its last election, for its previous election. So it's a fallacy to, to blame it all on the issue of electoral vote, because even if everyone is counted and allowed to you know get registered they're not all going to vote and we know the population of the country anyway the but was it, would you put the blame the electoral commission is part of the government's yeah. um, you know infrastructure yes. would you blame the president for not checking with them two years out are you getting ready one year out are you ready to do this election in 2016 or is he actually he been quite happy I, that they're not ready they couldn't physically stage an election last year I'll, I'll blame it on the infrastructure infrastructure, the, the, dem the democratic infrastructure, because the same infrastructure, which is the, the legal framework, you know, yeah. allowed him to stay in power until somebody is put there. So, you know, the infrastructure is weak, because if the sure. infrastructure is really strong, then the, this And I don't want to belittle the challenge yeah. of staging an election in the country oh, in that yeah, vast with, a, with, a, with a, um, you know, a population that big. Let's take a step back in history. Mm. Uh, one of the significant events, apart from all the internal struggles, and as yeah. you mentioned, nine nations, if not, have been meddling in DR yeah. Congo's um, history and warfare and, and, and struggles yeah. over the generations. The Rwanda factor, um, Townsend, when, w that was when you had this huge influx of migrants um, coming into the country. Is that still got a lasting repercussions now? It's difficult. It was uh, having an effect, uh, especially with uh, Joseph Kabila's father, Laurent Kabila, yeah. uh, who came in with the help of, yeah. of Rwanda 
and other forces from outside. So just go back in, uh, going back in history a bit, like you were saying, in 1960 when uh, the DR Congo came. became independent, yeah. Patrice Lumumba, mm -hmm. the first prime minister, yeah. was assassinated, and yeah. that's when Mobutu Sesseko took over. Yeah. Through all the years of Mobutu's leadership, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter how you say it, the infrastructure was never put in place. No. It was a one-party state, de facto, there were no elections, there was, it was one man. And club compared to other like economies, there were no real roads built, no, no. transport systems, yeah. no yeah. schools, no hospitals, or no. relatively few. No. Nothing, yeah. because at that point, uh, the DR Congo was the second most industrialized country in Africa, and it has been overtaken by all these countries. All that wealth has not sustained mm. or found its way to the villager in the country. So the institutions that Temi Top was talking about were not built at that time. Yeah. So when Laurel Kabila took over, he was also assassinated very, very quickly, shortly yeah. into his reign. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Joseph Kabila took over in 2001, he was very young, and he had the, uh, I mean, a, a support from Zimbabwe, from Angola, from all these regional forces who sustained his stay. So the institutions in the DR Congo were still not built even under him. So this is why you see even the opposition is weak. There's a possibility that this opposition uh, that is now part of the coalition or expected to be part of the coalition government might not even win an election <laughs> when it comes, yeah. yes. when it's due. Yeah. And it is difficult to see them having the election by the end of 2017, given the challenges that they will discover as soon as they go into power. And is, is that because the pol you know, politics is... Um, an immature art, an immature science, or the, the, the art of politics, the actual day-to-day -day doing of politics is difficult to do in DR Congo? It, it is in DR Congo. We, we should re rec recognize the fact that there are about 20 different re rebel groups. They are good in carrying weapons and not in the act of politics. Yeah. That's the way I'll put it. And what we found out is that each and every one that is even looking to go into politics, majority of them have either had an experience being a rebel. So that spirit of being a rebel is still there, and that's the way in which they practice their politics. Coupled with the, the, the regional, uh, uh, the other interplay from other countries that have an interest in the mineral resources and also the way in which the, 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 the system is run in, uh, in their, uh, their Congo. So yeah. I think there is a serious issue here, and this second, if it happens, second civil war, could actually destabilize the whole region. Well, in a moment, let's continue happens. our conversation yep. and say if it doesn't happen, it doesn't and we happen. can put war to one side, because yep. that's a bit of a hypothetical at the moment, isn't yes, it? it is. So in, when we continue our conversation, we'll look at the deadly fight for control of the DR Congo's untapped mineral wealth.